we are live everyone good evening everyone welcome to the 24th <laughs> chapter of uh, the master class in this series brought to you by the iso academics the topic for today is cutaneous melanoma i invite our president dr arnab gupta sir to please uh, open the today's session thank you srajan a very good evening to all of you uh, for the 24th pg master class we are just one short of quarter century and that's something we are looking forward to and that we hope to achieve before the uh, natcon conference which is coming up next month on 23rd and 24th of october and also 30th and 31st of october it's going to be a virtual conference and we request all of you to become member of iso and the students have the you know opportunity of having pre registration to register early so if you become a member you become a uh, you can register for the conference free of cost and the deadline for presenting uh, submitting an abstract is 30th of september that's all on behalf of the organizing committee at the same time i'd like to thank the you know uh, iis academic council for carrying on with such a wonderful pg master class from the uh, day one and we are really grateful to the four past uh, presidents who are advisors like dr arun chaturvedi dr sarangi dr kiran kothari and dr raja raman and we have this academic council being led by none other than dr t subramanian shrao and ably assisted by dr srijan shukla uh, this is going to be on melanoma i believe so all the best to the presenter who is going to be dr uh, mannar from chennai and we have very eminent faculties i'm sure they are all going to be introduced dr prashant venu madhu from puducherry dr bharat bhushan satpati from katak and dr vikas mahajan from chennai and we have a, a expert for dr prashant venu uh, madhu at the end so we look forward to that as well So without wasting any more time i would request dr sajan shukla to take the meeting forward thank you thank you sir uh, i request uh, dr rajaraman sir to please uh, uh, introduce our uh, dear examiners for today yeah um, uh, actually it is my pleasure to invite all the examiners and then thank them for their prompt response and then uh, accepting the invitation very at a very short notice Dr. Prashant is an additional professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology at Jipmer uh, Pondicherry. He had his MBBS from Kasturi Biomedical College, Bangalore, and MS from Andhra Pradesh College, Vishakhapatnam. He had his MCH from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, and he has got uh, over 40 publications. His areas of interest include thoracic oncology, hypex, head and neck surgery, and robotic surgery. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Bharat Bhushan Satpathy, and who has uh, did his uh, MS General Surgery from SCB Medical College from Katag, and is a senior resident in surgical oncology at the VMMC and Sabdajang Hospital in Delhi. He had his fellowship in uh, head and neck uh, oncology at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, New Delhi, and he is an assistant professor in surgical oncology at Acharya Hindwar Postgraduate Institute of Cancer at Katag, at Odisha. till date he has got new of publications to his credit and uh, is a very popular person and a uh, east thank you very much dr bharat and it is my pleasure to in, uh, introduce my friend dr vikash mahajan who has been associated with bs consultant in apollo specialty hospital for a long time he is a consultant in surgical oncology who practices at the apollo <laughs> cancer hospital and the kubaran hospital in chennai and his special areas of interest are upper ji thoracic and peritoneal surface malignancies thank you very much and welcome dr prakash vikas mahajan thank you sir yes sir dr thank you rajaraman sir sajan yeah uh, yeah thank you sir a uh, few uh, instructions for the session uh, this is a online session which is being live streamed also on youtube so it's there for posterity uh, for a dear candidate uh, we kindly request you to give to the point answers to the questions being asked if there's one that you don't know there's no harm in mentioning it as it uh, saves all of us some time and maintains the flow of this uh, online webinar our examiners have a habit of giving hints uh, all the time it's up to you to catch it for dear examiners uh, this is a mock clinical examination uh, please feel free to interject and cross examine the candidate uh, right from the get go uh, however there are online viewers present as well uh, so if there's some answer which is uh, left unanswered or has been incorrectly answered uh, we please request you to correct it and tell the expected answer uh, for the remaining participants uh, i hope you all take uh, this opportunity to clear your doubts and uh, also put in your uh, answers to the questions which are uh, 
uh, going through the uh, session. The first hour is a case discussion, which will be given 60 minutes. I'll be reminding the examiners at 30 and 60 minutes each. Uh, without uh, any further wait, I invite Dr. Manar, who's the presenting candidate for today, uh, to share his screen. Uh, I request Dr. Prashant, uh, uh, Dr. Bharat Bhushan, and uh, Dr. Vikas Mahajan sir to take the proceedings forward. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Dr. Manar. Uh, welcome for today's program. And uh, I think we are not wasting much time. We will take it from here. And then, so we'll uh, try and not stop you as much as possible. But in case if there is something which is going completely uh, away from the discussion, uh, so we may just stop you for a few brief minutes and then we'll carry forward. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Shall I start, sir? Is Go my ahead. screen visible, sir? Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I would like to thank ISO, ISO for providing me the opportunity to present in this forum. I will start with my case presentation. My patient is a 63-year-old male, it's a former coming from Nellur, Andhra Pradesh, as presented with chief complaints of ulcer in the right foot for the past two years. The history of presenting complaints, the patient was apparently normal two years back. He noticed a ulcer with two small black dots in the sole of his right foot two years back. She went to a nearby hospital. He was evaluated in a nearby hospital. He underwent a biopsy, which the details were not available with him. He had a histopathology report as melanocytic lesion with atypical and focal ulceration, diagnosed in 2019. Patient was advised for further excision and evaluation, but patient lost follow-up. He presented us in our OPD with complaints of ulcer in the ulcerative growth in the sole of his right foot, the same region of the previous biopsy site, for past four months. It was initially small to start with and gradually progressed to the present size. Patient gives approximately the size of five centimeter at the present size. History of black discoloration of the ulcer present, which was changing in color from initial light, light black to the present dark in color. Patient gives history of watery discharge from the ulcer for the past two months with full smelling discharge for the past 10 days. Patient gives history of discomfort while walking. There is history of itching present there is no history of smell lesion in the limb or elsewhere in the body. There is no history of any other swelling in the body. There is no history of fever. There is no history of trauma. There is no history of cough or breathlessness. There is no history of headache, vomiting. There is no history of abdomen distension. There is no history of bone pain. There is no history of loss of weight or loss of appetite. This past history is the patient is a known case of hypodiabetic mitosis and hypertension for the past 10 years on treatment, oral treatment. He is not a known case of tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, cardiac disease, or epilepsy. There is no history of surgery in the past except for the biopsy, which was done two years back. The patient is not a smoker or a alcoholic. There is no significant family history. A history summary of the history is a 63-year-old male farmer who is a diabetic and hypertensive with complaints of ulcerative growth with black discoloration in the sole of the right foot for the past two years. This history of no other swelling elsewhere and past history of biopsy done reported as Atypical melanocytic lesion with uh, focal ulceration. Atypical melanocytic lesion with focal ulceration. The clinical examination, patient's skin color is brown. The general examination is ECV status is 2. And general examination is conscious oriented, moderately built and nourished. It's safe brain. There is no failure, no cyanosis, no clubbing, no uh, jaundice or gentilization in front of body. The cardiovascular risk is examination or normal. Uh, it is the uh, picture of the patient, picture of the lesion. Uh, I'll go to the inspection. Uh, uh, eight cross six centimeter. Uh, the first, the gait. Uh, the patient predominantly walks on the right heel. Uh, the local examination of the right foot. Uh, eight cross six centimeter. Also a proliferative lesion present in the distal part of the plantar aspect of the right foot. I'm uh, occupying the area of the first to third uh, the metatarsals. It is extent is uh, medially from one centimeter from the medial edge of the foot. Approximately 13 cm from the heel and laterally up to the level of fourth toe. Distally, it extends into the into the toes, first to fourth toes. Dorsally, it extends into the first web space. The surface, uh, the surface is covered by black granulation tissue with minimal slough. Uh, minimal slough is there. There is no scars, sinuses, or dilated veins. There is no satellite nodules or intrans metastasis. 
the rest of the limb is normal on inspection the palpation uh, the ulcer bleeds on touch the surface bleeds on touch the uh, the the, uh, the the base is fixed to the soft tissue the surrounding skin is uh, the the fixed to soft tissue there is no uh, dilate there is no uh, no palpable uh, in transit or satellite metastasis but the ankle movements are normal the foot uh, the, fo the fo foot sensory system examination is normal there is no the distal pulses are normally felt the examination of the popliteal region there is no palpable uh, nodes in the popliteal region the examination of the inguinal region right inguinal region a uh, single soft uh, node of size 1.5 1.5 cross 1.5 cm not palpated in the right inguinal region in the vertical group Uh, red little group. Uh, so rest of the limb appears to be normal. Palp appears normal. The peri-abdominal examination is there is no hepatomegaly and there is no swelling palpable. The then head to toe examination of the exam there is no similar lesion elsewhere in the body. Uh, the spine and cranium is normal. Is spine and cranium is normal. Um, my summary. A 63-year-old farmer presenting with black pigmented ulcerative proliferative growth. The plantar aspect of the right foot slowly increasing in size, which is fixed to the deep soft tissue with clinically one palpable right inguinal node and no clinical signs of distant metastasis. With previous biopsy done in 2019 as atypical melanocyte lesion with focal ulceration. So my diagnosis will be a malignant melanoma of right foot. Okay. Okay. So. uh coming from the history uh, so is there anything a uh, very significant or important uh, prior history that you would specifically ask these group of patients prior to the ulcer like you know did he have any predisposing lesion so is that an important history that you would ask in presence of mole in the areas yeah mole or anything else it's just not a mole right anything else even a navy for that matter is also an important uh, history that you would you would ask these group of patients that is very important yes, and this probably this is not the right location maybe uh, you know for uh, the navy converting into mole so do all navy convert into transform into malignant melanoma no sir no sir so what is the percentage do you think that uh, navy uh, would uh, transform into malignant melanoma the melanoma will 50% of it will come from the navy sir 50% 50% yes which subgroup uh, the atypical molds the the junctional mold the the more the combo nevus those type of nevus will turn into melanoma yeah. so if they are non familial it is generally about 95% of them do not arise from an existing navy or mold Yes. Okay, so there are only some familial ones which come. So uh, majority of them do not exist from an navy or mole. Okay, so that's an important history. Yes. What is this type of melanoma called? Uh, Acral antigenous types. And this is probably arising. You had a very good history. So what does you? What do you think it is arising from? It is arising from a previous. Uh, atypical molds atypical molds normally these lesions arise in the sole of the full foot or the sole or the palm so or in the subungual region so what is the site basically uh, from which it is arising from the sole sir from the sole right. you have some junction and all in which it arises normally yes so So what are the signs uh, that the mole is converting into uh, melanoma? What are the signs? Sir, uh, the A B C D of melanoma is asymmetry. Sir, the B is border irregularity. Uh, C is color variation. D is diameter more than six millimeter. And E is elevation. If there are multiple mole suppose in the patient, so yes, if a patient complains uh, any particular mole is. Uh, Uh, although not showing clear features of ABCD, but uh, is there what is the indication of doing a biopsy? Suppose a single mole is um, changing a color. 
so whether we will do a biopsy in the patient or not yes, yes sir yes. multiple molars molars are there but there is clear cut abcd is not there if there is a multiple mole and there is a one one mole which is standing out differently i will the changing in color or any showing signs of any abcd i will do a biopsy So, Dr. Manner, what is ugly duckling sign? In case of multiple uh, moles, a one a, a one mole will stand so different from the rest of the moles. Yeah, so that is that is one of the indications for doing a biopsy. So that is very characteristic of uh, where it you know the ugly duckling sign is something which is very characteristic in a multiple neva especially. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes. Sir. And just a few points in your examination. Please don't use words like. black granulation tissue so there is no black granulation tissue that comes okay so these are uh, very specific things you know so when you say granulation there is no black granulation tissue okay and also some more comments on your examination you are talking about palpation of the ulcer please as well as the induration and other things you have to go in a sequence yes sir so you started off with the ulcer bleeding on touch and then you know you jumped off to uh, the other things okay so it has to go in a very uh, methodical so that it make, makes it easy so you know for the examiner uh, if you go step by step it makes it easy rather than the examiner trying to recollect and waiting for what you try to tell yes. otherwise you've correct you've covered most of the points in the examination too yes sir probably you should just describe the lesion completely first and then go on to the in transit and all uh, sites because uh, uh, you don't need to just do the inspection of the entire limb and then the ulcer that is not the way normally we'll expect you we want you to just describe the whole thing first and then go on to the surrounding areas which are also definitely relevant yes sir can you define satellite nodules and in transit nodules so satellite nodules or uh, the it is a intradermal or a subcutaneous uh, tumor deposits If it is noted within two centimeter from the primary tumor, it is a satellite nodule. So, and then and the intrinsic nodule will be more than two centimeter and within the draining lymph nodes, primary draining lymph nodes. Okay, so how does it? What is the prognosis between? Is there any difference in prognosis between intrinsic and satellite nodules? Does it change the staging? No, sir. No, sir. It will not change. It will come into stage three, sir. It will not. Both will have the same stage. So, what is your stage? Of what is the stage in your patient? Uh, the here we the tumor thick tumor uh, thickness we have to do a biopsy and we have to see here. It is if it is a clinically detected node is there and straight away go into stage three is it is positive? No, no. In your patient, you said it's a soft node. So do you think that it's significant in this patient? Do you call it significant one centimeter soft node in the groin? I have to evaluate this new thing. Okay, so. clinically, what is your staging? So. Clinically, I will keep it as stage three only. So, clinically, you will keep it as stage three. Stage three, unless I evaluate this biopsy and I approve this out, I will keep it as stage three. So. With this huge. Uh, okay, so you you feel that the load is significant? Yes, sir. You need to. Specify that the node is significant, and I will like to keep it stage three because I feel without evaluating the node, I cannot say anything. So clinical, it will become stage three once the node is positive. Yes, sir. Don't be underconfident in what you are trying to uh, convey. Be confident about that. That will help you in your exam only. Yes, sir. Do you would you like to give any differential diagnosis considering that the patient is a diabetic? For so many years, or you just want to give malignant melanoma of the right foot? Any other differential diagnosis that you would want to consider? Why not a squamous cell carcinoma? It can be. Uh, we can keep a second differential diagnosis. We'll keep it as pigmented variety of squamous cell carcinoma. So, do you get pigmented varieties in squamous cell carcinoma, or do you get pigmented varieties in basal cell carcinoma? Basal cell is more mostly. Yeah. So, but is that a common site for basal cell carcinoma? No, sir. No, sir. It's not a common site. 
not a common site for basal cell carcinoma yeah so everything that is black is not a melanoma and everything that is not black is again you know so you have to give a differential possibly the most common is a malignant melanoma because of its appearance but then and the history basically you have to mention you have to justify your answer based on that yes. and you had a previous history of that and therefore i will not like to give a differential diagnosis of course the question which is being asked is what other thing can be there if it's that previous history was not there okay um so okay yeah uh, told that, we move on yeah the, yeah i'm yeah. question you have told one that uh, it is fixed to the deeper soft tissues yes, uh, can you in the food can you differentiate whether it is fixed to the deeper soft tissue or uh, bone it is very difficult to differentiate sir but uh, the it is not it is not uh, purely immobile sir. some minimal mobility is there but it i am not able to, so not able to comment that as fixed to bones yeah you may not uh, comment that it is only fixed to the deeper tissues yes so what will you do next i would like to uh, take a biopsy sir first i will take to take a incision biopsy uh, full thickness incision biopsy including the wedge of a normal tissue sir then i will like to do pet scan of the whole body sir then i will like to evaluate the node with the ultrasound guided fnac fnac sir then i'll do even ldh for this patient sir clinically since this is a large tumor a uh, large lesion with uh, clinical nodal detector i'll do a ldh also based upon this i will uh, plan the treatments so do, you, do you think what is the depth of this lesion based on clinical based on clinical basis uh, it will be there more than 434 you'll definitely involve the progress so you will come to that it is a t4 means that and you have ulcerated t4 and ulcerated t4 b c so what will be the stage t4 b and with uh, one clinically detected node i will uh, keep it as 2 b c 2 uh, clinically detected node i will keep it as 3 a c in the non positive you have to see now what are the other different types of melanoma uh, based upon the clinical pathologically you can even to superficial spreading types it is the most common type the like uh, then the nodular variety then lentiginous uh, lentiginous malignant melanoma then the desmoplastic melanoma then uh, acral lentiginous melanoma then amel notic melanoma will also be what is a desmoplastic melanoma it is the uh, it is the uh, accumulation of spindle cell uh, spindle cells with a dense uh, stroma sir desmoplastic stroma what the it common has, it has it has the characteristic neurotropism it goes along the peripheral sheets what and it the... also have sir yeah yeah continue it also ha it also can have present as the amel notic type so lack it uh, decreased pigment lack of pigmentation can also be seen where is it present normally usually it will be in uh, head and neck area sir face okay are you aware are of any uh, i'm sorry dr bharat Then, what are the information you want from the pathologist in a small biopsy specimen? A small biopsy. I want to know the breast loss thickness. Sir. Okay. Then, uh, what type type of uh, lesion it is? Sir. Then, the number of my mitosis I will need to know. If pos, then if possible, I will need to know any uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte is there. Then. lymphovascular invasion lymphovascular invasion and with this biopsy that much uh, we, i will need to know how will you confirm on the pathology that it is a melanoma only 
Yeah, I will do immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry with uh, S100, HMB45 and Mark Jones. Is it mandatory? Will you do always uh, IFC? I will do uh, yes, I will do uh, minimum of S100 and HMB45. If the pathologist is uh, sure because the features of melanoma are very clear on uh, in histopathology. So in which type you may need a IHC or will you do a hundred always IHC is required? If it's pigmented variety is there, then you may not uh, need a IHC. This is uh, clear cut, the diagnosis is clear cut. Okay, sir. Well, in the variant, you may... Or if it is the unknown primary, in those situations, you may do the IHC to confirm. If the pathologist specifically says on HNE staining that it's a melanoma, then it's normally not required. Yes. This particular type of melanoma which we are talking about, is it common in uh, which group of uh, patients? It's common in dark individuals, sir. Applicants. I mean, mean in whites do not develop this type of melanoma? They do develop us, but... The, to the less incidents compared to dark people. Go ahead, Prashant. Sir? You are asking something. Yeah. So, what is the commonest molecular marker that you would ask the pathologist to do? And in which group of patients that would you ask? Molecular testing. I meant molecular testing. As a clinician, what do you what specific molecular testing that you would ask? This biopsies. Yeah, on the biopsy specimen. Yes, yeah. And in which group of patients would you ask? So, what about uh, anything? Something. To ask? Yeah, your voice. Is... Patient, you are, what do you want? Sir, I am not able to get you. Prashant, you have to repeat, your voice was breaking. Okay, okay. Uh, so, would you ask a BRAF mutation? BRAF mutation? Yes, sir. For this patient, I would like to do BRAF CV600. So, which are the other groups of patients that you would ask? Why will you ask in this group of patients? Why will you ask in this particular patient? It, it will, if it is stage, stage, it will come under stage 3, sir. You may be needing adjuvant. Therapy. So I will like to stage do two. Will you ask for it or not? Stage two, I will not ask for it. So in, okay. in, so in stage two, uh, now probably you will have to ask that also because there's a recent trial which has, of course, you are not, you will may not know, but in the recent uh, uh, conference which was held in Europe, the uh, data for uh, one of these uh, keynote. Uh, Trials have been presented for stage two also, and in stage two also the adjuvant uh, immunotherapy is helping uh, in survival. So and it's a pretty significant one, and the company is applying for approval for usage. So okay. of course it may take a little more time, but you may have to do these testing in the uh, stage two also. Okay. Okay. So how common is this BRAF mutation seen? Fifty percent of melanoma cases. 50% of melanomas. It's slightly more than that. It is actually seen even in about, uh, you know, 70% of them is seen and even it can be seen even in benign NEY2. So that is something that which you need to take into consideration. Okay. So that is something that which you really need to look into it. So as a clinician, you would want these informations. Okay. So all, all uh, this particular uh, marker which you will do, most of our patients who are poor may not be able to afford the kind of treatment which they have to go through. Like your, what will you give if it is BRAF positive? Yeah. What medicine will you give if it is BRAF positive? I'll give uh, Vimrafinib or Debrafinib. Yeah. With... So those are pretty expensive medications. So what can you also do in some group of patients and uh, the patient can have a much cheaper treatment? Yeah. What molecular marker can you do which will uh, let the patient have a much cheaper treatment in melanoma? Especially if it is an advanced melanoma, if the patient cannot afford these medications, it can 
use some other marker and if it is positive we can give that medication i don't know. essentially you can do a ckit ckit is positive in 20 to 30% of these advanced melanoma patients and you can give imanitib which is easily available nowadays and much cheaper than of course these Okay, so uh, so have we finished workup? Because I just got lost in between. How would you like to work up this space? Uh, sir, uh, after the biopsy, I would like to do the uh, PET scan whole body. Sir, Dr. Manna? Sir, your voice is breaking, sir. Yeah, uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 So, so you would like to get a PET scan in this Patient. Yes. Sir. Okay. How would PET change your management? Uh, PET, we will be detecting uh, any, any distant metastasis and also regional lymph nodes other than what I have been seeing, sir, clinically seen. In, no, in what? So, when a question like this is asked, you're expected to tell in what percentage of patients does a PET change management or upstage? In 20 to 25% of patients, but it's upstages. This stage. And about 30% pet up stages. Okay. What is the chances of incidence of detecting occult nodes by pet scan? In 15 to 20%. Sir. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. That's also about 15 to 20%. Pet scan detects by about 15 to 20% and up stages by another 30%. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So do you want an MRI brain in this patient? Um, it is a stage 3 melanoma. I will, leave. I will ask if the patient is not having any symptoms, uh, I will not ask for this patient. You will not ask for it. So, what is the recommendation as of now? And what is the level of recommendation? In stage 4 melanoma, uh, I will definitely ask for a MRI. MRI so. In stage 3 melanoma, uh, with symptoms of any symptoms of any pressure increasing or not, any headache or anyway uh, symptoms are there, I will, I will get nothing to MRI. Only, only if you have symptomatic patients and MRIs, now we ask for, or if you have a pet positive uh, patient mm -hmm. on the brain, uh, then you will ask for an MRI to detect more lesions which are not being picked up on the PET scan. Yes. So the recommendation in that manner is there. Any different, Prashant? No, no, absolutely fine, sir. So some of the guidelines do recommend a routine MRI, but then uh, in practice, it is only symptomatic patients. Only symptomatic that patients, is a very, yes. yeah, and it's a controversial thing. So I, uh, I think as a stand, only for symptomatic patients would be the choice right now. Okay, so PET scan shows, do not show any evidence of disease. Uh, but a faint uptake uh, in the uh, right inguinal node and no evidence of disease elsewhere except the foot. Okay, so what next? What would you like to do next? We'll do a ultrasonographic guided a finish of the nodes. Finish of the okay. Node. okay, negative. Negative for malignancy. If, it is so negative, if the node was, if the node was palpable, why you have to do an ultrasound guided FNAC? But it will be more representative. Representative is this method. How no. do you think a, it's a node 1.5 centimeter and how do you think an ultrasound will add to the uh, accuracy? If it is not palpable, uh, you may be, or your patient is very obese, then definitely ultrasound may give you a better. So you have to, uh, in the, in the, this thing, in the practical, practical aspect, you have to look at uh, if it is possible to do it easily, why you should ask for an ultrasound to do the same FNAC? Okay. I can, I can take my... Yeah, I can. See, all the recommendations are Western recommendations. You understand? So they will not do an FNAC if they, even if they pal palpate a node and they will do it ultrasound guided. It's something similar to a breast lump, you are able to palpate the breast lump, but they will say, no, we will do it either mammographically or uh, ultrasound guided, but you will be able to get a report easily if it is an easily palpable lump. Yes. The same thing 
uh, is true in this situation if you have a easily palpable uh, node and you can easily do an fnac there is no need for an ultrasound guided fnac yes any different no, no difference of opinion sir yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so the ultrasound guided FNAC, as you have asked, is negative for malignancy now. Okay. Yeah. So, what would you like to do? Then I will proceed with surgery, sir. The uh, for the. Yeah. Do you prefer getting uh, LDH? Do yes, you sir. prefer getting LDH levels routinely? Yes, sir. Uh, for this patient, I would like to do. Sir. Not for patient. all. How does it change management? Uh, if 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 it is uh, maybe for prognostic purpose, I will do sir. Will not change the management. How does LDH uh, add on to prognosis? Um, increase in LDH is a poor prognosis in my mind. Okay, so how does it? Uh, I mean, does it? Is it a part in you know in other stages other than stage four? It other than stage four, it is not a part. Important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then probably it really doesn't add much on to in non other than non metastatic it may really not add much on okay yes. yeah but you would routinely some of them do recommend and do not recommend so that's again another controversy that whether you should do or you should not do but yes routinely yes okay okay so yeah, now what next uh, what would you do for this patient I would like to do a, a four foot amputation with a minimum of two centimeter margin sir. With uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, and also with sentinel lymph node biopsies, and proceed. Since the node is also negative, I will also I will also remove that significant node if it is not sentinel lymph node. If it is not a uh, sentinel node. How will you do the sentinel node biopsy? We here we do we do a dual technique. Uh, with the uh, technician magnet able to radio plus plus uh, methylene blue dye on the day of surgery. Where will you? What is the procedure? Uh, we one hour before surgery we now we inject uh, 0.5 to 1 millicuvert around the tumor site and uh, uh, will inject it into the tumor. No sir, peri tumor release. You said tumor. Peri tumor around the around the tumor site. Peri tumor. Around the tumor. Okay. Tumor site. Please be very specific in these answers. Yes, sir. Unless, see, these are answers which, which the examiner will assess that whether you have done it or you have seen it or not, or you are just speaking from the head. You understand? Yes, sir. So you need to, when you're asking your question, you need to mention where will you inject, what will you inject, how many CC you will inject, how much time you will wait. Go ahead. When on the, on the table, I will, uh, I will also inject 1% uh, of methylene blue. Two to two to six ml very tumorally, and I will uh, I will look for the nodes in the popliteal and inguinal region for using gamma cameras. Gamma camera, and I will check for the radiation using gamma camera. And this is the hottest node. I will take it and set it for a frozen section. You will take it for frozen section. So, but I thought the present recommendation is that you should not do frozen section. Yeah, okay. I, I will, but uh, I will, beforehand, I will speak to the attenders about the about the need for what the complete is, examination to look for micrometastasis. Yeah? But if what is the problem section, with frozen section, sir? Uh, the micrometastasis will not be picked up. Uh, picked up, and we, we may need to do IHC on the left nodes. And uh, you do an IHC because for that a frozen section node you will not be able to do IHC. But if the IHC picks up some microscopic uh, uh, this disease only, what is the need for? You will do a uh, this thing. Will you complete the dissection or you will not complete the dissection? If it is a micro metastasis, I will not complete the dissection. If it is 0 0.01 millimeter, I will not complete the dissection. Why will you not? But the prognosis. What is the prognosis of the patient? Is it worse or? Is it same as not having a metastasis? It is not. It is like same like not having. It doesn't have to survival. No, it may not have a survival difference, but the nodal recurrence is more. Is more. No nodal recurrence is more. So 
you need to normally complete the uh, nodal clearance in this this, this group of patients okay. so basically for the rest of the people who are listening to or the participants uh, in no, the normal uh, requirement is to go ahead with the frozen section and uh, do a completion of the nodal clearance but this is a new thing which is coming up is that if you do a frozen section and uh, later on you you cannot do the ihc to pick up the micrometastasis and micrometastasis also has a prognostic importance in melanoma unlike uh, maybe breast cancer yes there's something called lymph node mapping yeah, yes sir for uh, if the pre of the previous day if uh, the if the lesion is in the uh, located in the uh, in the in the, tr in the trunk or the back Something that area I would like to do a pre-operative lymphocentigraphy to map the area of the training lymph node beforehand, sir. Since it is the uh, limb uh, in our hospital, we proceed directly with uh, beyond the day of surgery. What is the advantage of doing the lymph node mapping? With the... We know the exact pathway of the lymphatic drainage of the things. Can be a variation in the lymphatic drainage sometimes, more commonly in the trunk. Trunk and back. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Manar, let's assume that this patient had one in transit nodule at four centimeters. Okay. Uh, had an in transit nodule at four centimeters on the dorsum of the foot from the tumor. So, a single in-transit nodule, how will you manage this? I will, I will uh, four, four centimeter from this, I will not able to give uh, adequate margin with uh, four foot amputation. So, uh, so, I will, in the foot, sir, four centimeter from in the foot. Yeah, in the foot itself. Let's. I'll give you two scenarios. One, one first scenario is an intransic nodule in the foot, and the second scenario is another nodule in the leg. In the foot, I will uh, revise the. Uh, I will. I will do a formal BK amputation for this patient. If it is four centimeter. I will not be able to give you a two centimeter clearance without. Uh, maintaining a for uh, maintaining a. Even with the tarsal metatarsal amputation or some amputation, I will not be able to give two centimeter clearance for this patient. So I will do a BK amputation. If it is in the leg, I will formally exercise with the negative two centimeter negative You would exercise the lesions. Let's say yes. there are multiple cuts, like multiple in transit nodules. If it is multiple multi in transit nodules. If it is multiple in transit nodules. Hmm. Uh, I will see whether it is amenable to excision if it is clustered to a single area or not, sir. If it is amenable to excision without any, if it is reconstructable, I, uh, I will uh, straight up, I will still go for excision. Sir. If that is not possible, then I will try with the intralational therapy. Sir. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, any, could you just briefly touch upon uh, ILI and ILP in case if you have any idea about those two met methodologies? Yeah, yes, sir. In case of uh, multiple entrants in metastasis and uh, recurrent uh, entrants in metastasis, we can go, we can go, go for uh, hypothermic uh, isolated limb coefficient or uh, isolated limb infusion therapy, sir, where we use, where first we will... Uh, Isolate the limb using a tourniquet. Then, we'll, in hypothermic isolated limb perfusion, we will uh, we'll have the surgical access. We will cannulate the vein on the artery with using a hot lung machine. We will inject. We will perfuse uh, high dose melphol and 10 mg per uh, liter uh, over, over, over over 90 minutes. We will perfuse the high dose uh, melphol. It has it has a good uh, good rate of success rate 80 to 90 percent. Okay, good. So coming back to basics. So uh, let's let's presume that uh, uh, you know uh, this is a small uh, five millimeter lesion somewhere in the thigh. So what would you? How would you diagnose these lesions? Five, five millimeter lesion. Okay. Uh, yeah, five millimeter suspected lesion in the thigh. 
So now the patient has come to you, and how would you? Let's just for the sake of discussion, I'm asking you. I'm just deviating so that five millimeter. I will uh, by NCC. I will go with the uh, excision with the narrow margin, one two three meter margin. I will uh, I will examine the breast loss thickness. Then I will again proceed. And what okay. depth you will take? Sir, I will take a full full thickness up to the level of the sub, uh, fascias. Subdivide will remove the subdivide tissue up to the level of fascia, not including the fascia, unless it is involved. So you have excised the region that four foot amputation you have done, or a wide excision you have done. What are the things you will see in your pathology report? Pathology report, I will like to sir, see. Sir, just sir, just interrupting, sir. Uh, one question. Yeah, yeah. The level of amputation uh, is uh, is to be decided. Any imaging you have to do, or only it is a, you have not done anything about foot imaging. Sir, your level of amputation. Now, whether you want to do any imaging of the foot for uh, this patient, uh, I have done a PET CT, sir. But it is clinically it is in the distal foot. I would, uh, even with uh, it is not in the PET CT also has done. It doesn't show any bone involvement. So I will decide clinically. So clinically, with the two centimeter margin, I can. I think I can give. A... Uh, you don't. You don't need any MRI. Or any soft tissue extension is there or not? For this this patient, I don't think I need. Maybe. I think for PET uh, CT, the purpose is to look for the metastasis, metastasis. and the local uh, surgical planning has to be done according to a soft tissue imaging like MRI. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So next question. You, yeah, whether yes. what will be the uh, what will you look for or what do you expect to find on the pathology? What are the things which you will look for in a pathology report? For wide excision of melanoma, Asia. First, uh, first the type of the melanoma. Then, so it's the a margins. It's a it's an important question again for the people who are listening, participants, because uh, you need to when you excise a, a melanoma, you need to see in your report. Just like uh, if if you are doing a a hemicolectomy, you need to see that there are twelve nodes are there in the specimen or not. That gives you an idea about the completion of the surgery as well as uh, for staging and whether your pathologist has used diligence to uh, examine the specimen. The same way, when you are seeing a melanoma uh, report, you need to have certain parameters which have to be mentioned in the report. So that is what I am asking you. So the type of the melanoma, then the tumor thickness, plus thickness, I like to know. Then the margins which are given. What margin? The minimum of two centimeter margin for this patient. For this patient, the proximal margin. Okay. That is a surrounding margin. Surrounding margins. Yeah. That's all. No, no, sir. Uh, then I would like to see the mitosis, uh, mitotic mitosis per millimeter square. Then tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, tumor regression score. Mm -hmm. Then uh, any micro satellites are there or not? Sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's. Then I'll do breast infiltration also for this. Very neural infiltration. Very neural infiltration, lymphovascular infiltration. Okay, lymphovascular or angio lymphatic invasion. Depth, the tumor depth and depth you have already mentioned, but the deeper margin. If this is not an amputation. The deeper margin also has to be uh, mentioned about that. Okay. Yes. So these are important things which you must see in the specimen report. Otherwise, you will miss out on the prognostic. So, what are the prognostic factors in a melanoma? Melanoma, from we have to start from the can start from age, age old, age yield, age more than 50, 60, 60 years, uh, 60 years old, uh, poor prognosis. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, sex male people uh, tend to have poor prognosis compared to female patients. Sir. Then, the breast loss thickness, uh, thickness, then lymph node status. Sir. Then uh, increased mitosis, prognosis. Then presence of uh, tumor infiltrating first a good prognosis. Increase in LDH level as poor prognosis. Then uh, neurotrop is some lymphovascular invasion or poor prognostic factors. Uh, then 
then the location location is also besides the prognosis if it is a mucosal melanoma it has a poor prognosis compared to the extremities and melanomas Uh, sir, I'm back. I just had some internet issues. So, sorry, I've just joined back. Hmm. We were just asking the prognostic factors and the pathology yes, report. Yes. So, you can go ahead with the next one. Yes. Uh, yeah, but that's it. Most of it we have covered. Uh, so, uh, can you just briefly tell about the uh, extent of margins? In, uh, not in this patient, but in generally. Based upon the breast flow thickness, we will decide the margins. So if it is a melanoma in situ, uh, if it, I'm able to give adequate one centimeter margin, I will go for an adequate one centimeter margin. If not, 0.5 centimeter is acceptable. So if it is a one millimeter melanoma, I will give a one centimeter margin. If it is a one to two millimeter, one to uh, two millimeter melanoma, I will give a one to two centimeter margin. If it is more than Two centimeter, two millimeter melanoma. I'll give two centimeter margins. Okay, yeah, that's that's good. So that's important. Uh, you know, margins uh, surgery with adequate margins is something that which is uh, very important and uh, one of the most important prognostic feature. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so there's one anything? question. One of the questions which has come up. In the chat box is, uh, what about limb salvage surgery? You think you can salvage the limb in this or whether you will give some new adjoint chemotherapy or immunotherapy maybe and then do limb salvage? Mm, no, sir. For this patient, uh, I don't think I can do therapies. I think that answers and uh, that question. So, uh, any uh, you know what are the any evidence as of now for neoadjuvant therapy in any situation? Uh, only in, it is given under only in clinical trials basis. So we have to trial basis we can give. And okay. in the as of now, what yeah. what is yeah. the neoadjuvant? Okay. As of now, it's not the standard. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is being used for. Uh, Melanomas on the face and all, from probably when you give again pembrolizumab and uh, it may disappear and it may have a better survival also. There is some initial reports which are coming, uh, but it is not the standard of care. Yeah, they are using pembrolizumab for uh, as a treatment for a superficial melanoma also, and uh, they have got good results in that. Okay. I think any other questions? Um, no other questions, sir. Next question. Dr. Srijan, where are you? Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Dr. Manar. Uh, you did very well. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Bharat Bhushan, sir, and uh, uh, Prashant sir to kindly uh, give their uh, uh, compliments and comments for Dr. Manar and any uh, tips for other students uh, uh, who might be going into exams with this case. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sijan. Uh, so, Dr. Manar, you have really done very well in this uh, your exam. Uh, melanoma is a separate topic actually. It usually comes as a short question, very and you have to be specific on your answers. As uh, um, uh, everybody has told you, you have to be very specific. And you, for this melanoma, all are almost specific, and the treatment is not related to any other malignancies. So you have done really well. Thank you, sir. Prashant, sir. 
Yeah, uh, Dr. Mannar, uh, good job actually. Melanoma is something that which is very tricky and uh, complicated, but uh, my uh, suggestion to you is yeah, uh, go in a very systematic fashion. You have extremely done well when it comes to management, uh, but in the exam, you know, the examiners get swayed away by the way you present your examination findings. Yes. So unfortunately, uh, you know, you may not reach your uh, strength if you do not do well on your the way you present the examination findings. Yes. Uh, so since it's an online, many of us did not stop you. Uh, but then, you know, uh, people would have stopped you at every level when uh, and you don't even go ahead. Yes. I know it's not fair uh, to test you like an MBBS student, but I think that's the that's how exam goes. And we are changing. We are changing gradually, you know, concentrating on management predominantly, but you've done a fantastic job. You've done a fantastic job. You've read well. You've read well. Thanks. I have one last question uh, for you, Manar. If this same lesion was there on the sole of foot, not on the uh, front part, on the back part, what would you have done? I would, I would done a the similar size lesion. I will uh, I'll do the BK amputation. BK amputation. No. So you will normally, if it is not involving the bone, usually you will not do a BK amputation. So you will just do a wide excision. And how will you reconstruct that area? Because that is a weight bearing area. So how will you reconstruct? So because you did not have the, the lesion there, this question was not asked from you. But this is a that is the more common site for that uh, melanoma of the foot. So if that happens, then what will you answer? If you say BK amputation will not be accepted at all. I, I will do your rotate flap flap covers. Give you what flap, flap cover? Like uh, what kind of flap cover? That area you have you just put a flap, it will patient will have an ulcer and he will not come to know anything. You basically need to put a sensate flap. Okay. And there has to be a, this is for your reading. Now you find out what kind of sensate flap, which can be used to cover that area. Okay. And what are the different other flaps, which can be used to cover that area. And the nerve has to be, uh, it has to be a sensitive area. Otherwise you'll end up in trouble. Okay. okay. So that is the last, this, this is for the rest of the audience. Also, they have to uh, know about this particular, because most of these melanomas come in that area and it is very easy to do a um, amputation or put a graft and all, but that is a weight wearing area. So yes. you need to normally think about a sensate flap there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we go to our uh, next segment for uh, the webinar today. Uh, we invite Dr. Prashant uh, Enmadu to deliver his uh, talk for the day. Uh, sir, if you could uh, share your screen. Uh, and while you do that, uh, sir, any final comments from Dr. Vikas Mahajan, sir, for this case discussion and for the students? Sorry, sir, you are uh, muted, sir. Yes. I am muted. So, yeah. yeah, what I was saying is that he's done pretty well uh, that way. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, we'll request you and uh, Dr. Bharat Bhushan, sir, to please stay uh, for the third uh, segment, which is the QA with the examiners. Uh, yeah. Over to Dr. Prashant, sir, now. Uh, sir, you have our full attention. Uh, you may please begin. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the, uh, ISO. And this is a wonderful platform. I've been attending these lectures uh, quite, and I think uh, the case presentations, which the postgraduates is, it's a fantastic opportunity to come out. And uh, most of the things have been covered. What I'm going to talk has been covered as questions and Manar has answered them beautifully. But luckily I have few surprises for you all, so which I think uh, will not make it boring. Uh, Okay, uh, yeah. So, uh, are the slides moving? I think that's the first thing to ask. And are yes, you able to see the slides? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll take uh, briefly about uh, introduction pathogenesis. Uh, you know, what workup, most of it is covered and a little bit extra beyond ABC. 
surgical management trials which were not covered in the discussion and advanced melanoma which we didn't discuss at all uh it's a fifth most common cancer and it's a serious problem in the west we are fortunate that we don't have this dreadly disease because uh the mortality seems to be very high and it constitutes 1.6% of all cancer deaths it is a challenging uh, to diagnose pathologically because it has got a lot of variability in cytomorphology architecture its similarity to benign nevus is something that which makes the pathology very challenging and just presence or absence of a uh, melanin pigment doesn't alone make it a melanoma now coming on to etiology and taxonomy there's been a lot of changes in the recent who classification where they have classified these group of patients based on uv light exposure which is supposed to be one of the most important uh, etiological factor and they have categorized these into low cumulative sun damage i would henceforth call it csd and the high damage or the other possibility the other etiology is a physical traits wherein you know uh, the light skin people or the blue green or eyes or the red and blonde hair are more likely to develop the mole phenotype is something where you have patients with low nevus counts or the high nevus counts and mind you the familial predisposition is very important so there are these are some of the syndromes that i have listed below who are likely to develop more uh, melanoma and it is important to ask these specific syndromes p50 is one thing i think which has been missed out and uh, it is not very common luckily when you uh, be aware in the exam when we say that you know family predisposition we can close our eyes and say 53 mutated tumors but melanoma please do not do that it's not very common this is the classical morphological classification that we have been looking up at since ages but in 2018 who has come up with a new classification and which we are much way beyond this so predominantly as you see this classification is based on two phases that is the radial phase as well as the vertical growth phase so among these the superficial spreading is something which is got only the radial phase and less of a vertical phase otherwise nodular lesions have more of a vertical phase rather than the nodular phase and we know that the vertical growth phase is the one which increases the chances of lymph node involvement as well as prognosis becomes poor so these are some of the classifications which uh, molecular classification which has been designed so there are different pathways so they have divided them into exposure low exposure and high exposure and without exposure so if you see the pathway 1 2 and 3 these are the group of things which are associated with an exposure whereas the no exposure are from pathway 4 to 9 so superficial spreading alone is the one which is uh, even with a low cumulative sun exposure is something that it is superficial spreading whereas the lentigo and desmoplastic are with a higher csd exposure so for your further reading which is interesting i will not get into the details of the other two charts wherein you have different pre malignant as well as the malignant and what are the common mutations that are actually seen in different types of uh, uh malignant melanomas and accordingly they are classified so this is for your reading and i think it's important that you have an idea about the molecular pathogenesis i did not put up the big chart that is given in the favorite uh, books of all of us that's divita because it's very confusing but it is important to know how the braf as well as the nras works and how the pathogenesis in malignant melanoma it's beyond the scope of this lecture as we'll try to keep it as basic as possible so this is this is another uh, picture so coming to clinical presentation and work up it's these are some of the important history that you need to ask is there any pre existing lesion how many lesions what are the number of lesions where is the location of the lesion and is there any evolution or change over time and what is the importance of sun exposure and family history 
these four things are that something which are very important if you're suspecting a melanoma. Clinical diagnosis, I think ABCD has been very well covered, whereas evolution is something that is a new one which added. The sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing melanoma, if it's a single criteria, it's about 97% and all five jointly, whereas specificity, if you join all five, is about 100%. So there are situations where you cannot use this. So you have another modified Glasgow criteria. This is mainly predominantly used in peripheries where is the patient a candidate for referral? Glasgow seven point checklist is something which easily helps. So you have three major and four minor of which if patient has one major and two minor or three minor, then that becomes an indication for referral. So these are more or less the same, but a slight they have categorized them into major and minor. So exceptions to ABCD criteria are the nodular melanoma where you do not see. So you have an EFG criteria that is elevation, firm on palpation and continuous growth. For nails, it is not, ABCD doesn't work because you do not see any of these features. So you have ABCD, EF, but which are completely different. That is for age, African-Americans, Asians and Native Americans are brown to black bands, change in the nail bed. The digits are most commonly involved and extension of the pigment onto the proximal or nail fold and family history. And pediatrics, again, is another classification, which is ABCD, as well as the cup classification. Uh, these are some of the signs that in pediatrics, because they do not typically present with any of these symptoms. And most of them are amelanotic in pediatric group, where they are pink, red, or changing color majority of the times. And they may mimic exactly like a pyogenic granuloma. So these are some of the exceptions. Uh, there are many supporting techniques that which have come and among these, I think the two most important are dermoscopy and reflective confocal microscope, which uses an IR based and these two actually help in assisting diagnosing malignant melanoma to a larger extent. So there are, but whatever said and done, histopathology still remains the gold standard for majority of these and undoubtedly. So these are Clark's and Breslow's thickness, which have been gone through. These are the older uh, classifications. And I've just put up the AJCC staging. Please, uh, it's important that the AJCC 8th edition has a lot of changes when compared to 7th edition for cutaneous as well as the mucosal melanomas. Uh, please kindly go through this in detail. I'm not going to take away your time going through this. Now coming to some of the controversies, whether you want to do an incision biopsy or an excision biopsy. Preferred is for smaller lesions, an excision biopsy with one to three millimeter margin. But however, an incision biopsy for larger lesions is something that is recommended for lesions on the face, palm, sole, or nail. And nail biopsy is something which needs special attention because the technique of nail biopsy is completely different, whether you can take from a nail fold, nail bed, or a nail matrix. And what are the pros and cons? The major problem with doing an incision biopsy is you may not be able to tell the exact thickness. That is, the breastlose thickness may not be possible if you just take a small punch biopsy for a smaller lesion. And it would be challenging and difficult to stage these group of patients. And what do you do after you know that you have done an incomplete excision? So this is another challenge with an incision biopsy. But if you see the outcomes, there is no difference in outcomes, whether you have done an incision or an excision biopsy. And it's only that 33% of the people, uh, the uh, population, the, I mean, uh, prefer to do an excision biopsy, but rest of them either go in for a scrape biopsy or a punch biopsy. Uh, yeah, histopathology, as I said, histopathology, IHCA, uh, fish or molecular techniques are something. These are some of the essential data which I have listed out. The same thing which Dr. Manar very nicely pointed out. Diagnosis, breast loss, thickness, ulceration, mitosis, any microscopic satellites, vascular invasion, surgical margins. Other prognostic data is Clark level growth phase, whether it is radial or vertical, 
regression present or absent tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and histological type is something which are expected from a histopathology report for the clinician to take further additional steps in management. Staging investigations not indicated in stage one and stage two. Stage three, a CT PET or and uh, chest X-ray. This we have discussed in detail during the uh, during the evaluation. So we will not waste time on this. Now coming to management of stage one to stage three. Surgery remains the mainstay of treatment. So we will cover what is adequate margins, extent of lymphadenectomy, treatment therapy in stage one to stage three. So, Surgical, treatment, uh, surgical excision with clear histological margins is something which is important. But regional lymph node management has always remained controversial because complete lymphadenectomy for all patients with melanoma, regardless of whether there was regional nodes or not, was being the standard of care. But let's see what today is the standard. So these are some of the trials which you should all know, that's the WHO melanoma program trial, the French group, Swedish intergroup trial, and the British group trial have tried and tested for various margins. So for tumors, as rightly said, for in C2, five millimeters to one centimeter, for thinner melanomas, it's about one centimeter, and for thicker melanomas, more than two, it is two centimeter margin that is adequate to avoid recurrence in majority of these patients. Regional node management, N0, sentinel lymph node biopsy is a standard of care in stage one to three. It, where do you avoid in only patients with stage 1A without ulceration? And in large meta-analysis, the false negative rates has been as high as 12% with different combined modalities of sentinel lymph node biopsy. So these are, uh, there are a few trials I've listed. I have not listed all the trials, but uh, for residents, it is important to know MLST1, MLST2, and the other few other trials, which I will be talking about. So these are trials related to sentinel node biopsy, wherein uh, patients were randomized to sentinel lymph node followed by complete lymph node clearance or nodal observation. They found that there was no difference in 10-year follow-up for intermediate and thick melanomas. But however, disease-free survival favored the sentinel lymph node group. And in patients with nodal metastasis, sentinel lymph node had a lower risk of death when compared to the observation group. So based on this, sentinel lymph node biopsy is recommended for all these group of patients. This is one of the landmark trials which actually proved sentinel role of sentinel lymph node biopsy. Coming to management of positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, central compartment lymph node dissection has been adequate staging. Come after completion, you would know if there are more number of lymph nodes involved and also it also prevents spread of disease further. Two randomized control trials, whereas the DCOG trial and the MLST1, DCOG was stopped in between because of recruiting patients, whereas MLST2 went ahead and said, that the disease control rate was improved in the immediate CLND group. But the meta-analysis, however, including four randomized other randomized control trials, said that there was no benefit in completing a lymph node dissection. So with the current available evidence, patients with positive sentinel lymph nodes, either CLND or observation is acceptable. But however, if patient has high risk features, Pros and cons needs to be discussed because complete lymph node dissection has its own morbidity and associated morbidity. So coming to management of satellite and in-transit metastasis and melanoma, as very well defined, two centimeters and beyond two centimeters, and but within the draining zone are called satellite and in-transit metastasis. And impact, it generally tends a poor prognosis, but among the two, there is not much of a difference and henceforth, both of them have been grouped together. Their microsatellite, or satellite or in-transit are categorized as N1C, N2C and N3C according to the number of positive regional lymph nodes irrespective of whether they are clinically occult or clinically detected. So what are the treatment options? We have local therapy, regional therapy and systemic therapy. Local therapy, the effect is to reduce morbidity and most common techniques are intralesional injection. You can use local ablative therapies or topical 
therapy uh, topical therapy radiation or regional therapies are isolated limb perfusion and infusion a single slide uh, that uh, showing the different agents which has uh, which are used so this is a first in class oncolytic virus based on the hsv type 1 that is talimogen tvec which shows a which showed a 50% size reduction and definitely has shown improvement in drr and prong and also longer median overall survival the other lesions are interleukin 2 bcg and rose bengal these are the other intralesional therapy uh, the most commonly used are the first two and local are laser abrasion or carbon dioxide laser or imicmod therapy or you know difenfiprone is another agent which topical therapies have also been tried for in transit of satellite nodules so this nccn guidelines also the leisure, the uh, the care is more or less similar based on evidence intralesional or systemic therapy but depending on whether there is no you would try to or palliative or limited excisions or regional therapies like ilp and ili melphenan is the most commonly used drug as rightly said for ilp with an overall response rates of 90% and median complete response rate is around 58% so this is uh, uh, so ilp should be offered in patients who have regional or uh, in transit or satellite nodule metastases which are not the first choice is always uh, surgery when it can be operated or intralesional ilp and ili are something that which are kept as an alternative in extensive diseases adjuvant therapy uh, we have discussed not indicated in low risk patients and high risk node negative 2b or 3c 2 2c and 3a tumors with snd containing only less than 1 mm is again not indicated but in all other stage 3 adjuvant therapy improves recurrence free survival and is indicated so what is the choice of drug either nivolumab or pembrolizumab for one year has shown definite improvement in the disease free survival whereas braf mutated patients and those who cannot tolerate nivolumab or pembrolizumab dabrafenib with trametinib is an alternative with improved overall survival at 3 years ipilimumab was the drug of choice before these but then it is less preferred due to its toxicity so now coming to stage 4 uh so distant metastasis unfortunately melanoma is something that which can spread to anywhere skin soft tissue visceral bone brain you name and name an organ it does spread and elevated ldh levels in metastatic setting is associated with a very poor prognosis as it upstages itself to m1c is there a role for surgery in metastatic melanoma yes possibly where the benefit is very clear when there is an uh, anemia due to intestinal metastasis obstructive when there is obstruction cutaneous or with ulceration pain for palliation basically lymph node metastatic with neurological symptoms symptomatic brain metastasis or life threatening hemorrhage from metastasis surgical removal or stereotactic radiation of local regional recurrence or a single distant metastasis should be considered in fit patient as a therapeutic option offering potential for long term disease control in the recommend level of recommendation is too high for this so these are some of the currently approved therapy for uh, metastatic uh, melanomas you have different chemotherapy where the response rates are very modest metastatectomies if they are isolated single systemic or intralesional interleukin ipilimumab braf inhibitors radiation pdl1 interferon therapy and other uh, drugs like imicmod adoptive t cell therapy have been tried so uh, just a brief systemic or intralesional il2 was considered the first line in unresectable in good performance status irrespective of braf mutation and it is definitely shown uh, superior to systemic therapy then came the in 2011 the blue map for the treatment of unresectable melanomas currently first line braf negative unresectable poor performance status and second line for patients with good performance status irrespective of braf mutation there is tramilumab which is safe as a single dose similar overall survival as standard other chemotherapy but 
but the best part is the response duration is significantly longer. I know we may not be interested, but it is important to know that there are many treatment options available for metastatic. And DRAF inhibitors, yes, nearly 50% of them have, and Vemurafenib or Regrafenib is some, some of the options. And these are promising in treatment for those with active brain lesions have shown 30% tumor regression rates. They do develop resistance and then Dorab and Dabrafenib is something that which is coming up, can be combined with Trametinib, which is already proven to be effective as adjuvant therapy in this group of patients. anti pdl one checkmate trials are coming and I think this, the immunotherapy is the future for majority of these metastatic disease. And uh, now, as of now, anti pdl one is the standard of care for those patients without a BRAF mutation and opt as a first line, even in patients with mutation. Interferon, vaccines, and other things, the role is not very clear and still investigational. Uh, so, as I said, this is just a repetition. So, patients with metastatic melanoma, it's important to detect a BRAF mutation. PDL blockade and ipilimumab are now the standard of care, regardless as first line setting. For BRAF mutated, all options available for WT melanoma are still valid with the addition of BRAF if not used in the first line setting. So, this is what the NCCN guidelines also say for therapy depending on the BRAF mutation status. So, to conclude, diagnosis is challenging and histology remains the standard. Surgery with adequate margin improves survival. Adjuvant therapy, as and when indicated in stage three, and definitely improves overall survival and recurrence free survival. So, I would like to stop here and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Prashant, sir. Uh, thank you for that effort that you've put in to get all this together and definitely covered A to Z of uh, everything that's there in melanoma. Uh, so, we come now to the uh, third segment, uh, what we do in this, uh, throughout these master classes, we choose certain practical problems and uh, certain gray areas, which are beyond the literature. Uh, of course, these questions I have uh, put across to certain examiners, but the other examiners are equally welcome to contribute. Uh, so we'll start with the first one for uh, uh, Vikas, sir. Uh, so how do we stratify patients on initial biopsy? Uh, whether it's uh, incision or excision, because uh, <laughs> margins have to be planned on the depth of invasion, uh, etc. And those information will and may not always be available with us. So uh, how do we plan margins really in our patients? So can you hear me? Sir, yeah. So basically it depends on the site of the lesion and the size of the lesion. So what we would normally do is to, if it is a easily excisable lesion and the lesion, the skin can be closed. So in which situation you can remove the lesion with a two millimeter margin, because some of these lesions like subotic keratosis also appear like melanoma. So if you excise with a big margin, it is of no benefit for the patient. Uh, in a situation where the lesion is large and you need to do uh, some kind of a repair, a graft or anything in those situations, it is better to do a, a wedge biopsy with full thickness and then plan the uh, complete excision because you will need to give a two centimeter clearance. If you have to take a wedge biopsy, means that you may need to take a two centimeter clearance all around. So, in which will invariably require a reconstruction, and therefore, in these situations, a initial biopsy will be a wedge. So, that is the way you need to stratify the two two types of biopsies. Punch and all that is normally not recommended unless it is a huge something like that. that. That's, that's great, sir. So depending on whether we require flap or not, any inputs from Prashant, sir, and uh, uh, Bharat, sir? Uh, no, I, I completely agree with uh, Vikas, sir. Uh, so, you know, that's the best way of uh, the plan margin. I mean, how do you, how do you go about doing a biopsy? Uh, our next question to uh, Prashant, sir. Uh, sir, SLNB positive uh, today, uh, would you advise completing uh, the lymphonectomy? 
uh, yes, this is something that uh, I know the evidence and what uh, uh, what is done in routine practice. So, if you uh, yes, uh, the the again, it's a problem of frozen section here. If you don't send frozen section, and you know if the report comes later, uh, probably and the other there are low risk features. I probably wouldn't because. Uh, uh, you have adequate data to say that either you observe these group of patients or go ahead and then complete the uh, lymphadenectomy. There is no difference in outcome. But yes, if you have an on table and if your frozen says that you have lymph nodes positive, uh, then uh, yes, I would complete. Uh, otherwise, then why would I even do a sentinel lymph node biopsy is my thought process. So then why are you doing it? If you don't want to complete it, then why do it at all? Other than that, unless and until you're just staging these group of patients. So that is one reason, staging better probably. Uh, but yes, because the staging also is important whether you're detecting clinically palpable nodes or occult nodes. So, you know, the entire staging is dependent on this. The nodal staging is dependent on this too. So if I get a frozen done and if I have a positive node, I would complete it. But if it comes later on positive, I would explain to the patient and then observe the patient. Excellent. Uh, so, but sir, yeah. so my comment is that if the node is positive in our in our uh, scenario in our country, we would probably go ahead and complete the dissection. The main reason being that the follow up, which is recommended in the trial, is three monthly ultrasound. For the next every every follow up, the patient must undergo an ultrasound of the inguinal region, which may not be practically feasible in our country, and therefore we may have to go ahead. But the morbidity of a complete lymph node dissection has to be kept in uh, mind. And uh, if it is positive, of course, we need to go ahead and remove everything. Right. Uh, one question from me: This in this. Whether we should complete the with only uh, inguinal or uh, ilo inguinal if one node is positive? See, conventionally, we will do an ilo inguinal block dissection only. If it is an inguinal positive, one level above, we will clear it up. Right, sir. Uh, next question to Dr. Bharat uh, Sarpati. So, what is your dye of choice today for SLNB? So, the trials mentioned radiocolloid dye with uh, the older dyes of blue dyes and their problem with limbs and the newer dyes like ICG coming into uh, more and more OTs, uh, what is your choice today? The radio colloid is always the first choice, but uh, if uh, centers are not having this facility or anything, so we're using uh, also methylene blue in some cases, but uh, on, on like breast, it is not uh, that much uh, helpful in um, limbs, especially in lower limb. Uh, ICG personnel, I don't have any experience. So anybody using ICG for uh, this SLNMB can comment. Right. So Srijan is using uh, this uh, uh, dye definitely. And of course, you need some yes. special equipment again for, uh, for this dye. It is not going to be just the blue color. You have to have the fluorescent detector for that. So if, uh, of course, it is considered nowadays equivalent to uh, your colloid, radio colloid in breast cancer. So we are also at present not using, but sometimes we have used it in some situations, but the main thing is the machine. Yeah. Prashant, sir, you are saying something? Prashant, yes. we are using this. So we are not using ICG, sir. Uh, blue dye or the gamma probe, sir. ICG yeah, so requires definitely extra equipment. Uh, uh, but yes, blue dye or the uh, gamma probe is something that we... I thought you had a robot. When the robot will have all this uh, uh, ICG detection, these things also. <laughs> we do it for rectum and other things, sir. We do it for rectum. Routinely, we use ICG for rectum and conduce and even endometrium. Uh, most of thing now, I mean, because ICG facility is available in the robo, we have started doing routinely for endometriums. But uh, for inguinal lymph node biopsy, we don't get the robotic OT, sir. I wouldn't mind doing it. <laughs> right, sir. Next question to Vikas, sir. sir. Uh, in the lower, uh, lower source setting, uh, Sir, what any efficacious systemic therapy is there that uh, you would offer to the patient if they cannot afford anything on that uh, table that we saw? 
so these patients are in 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 our setup or in our group we normally do give interferons also although they have more side effects and sometimes uh, single dose chemotherapy are also used uh, like your temozolomide and uh, earlier dacavazine so they are also used and we have or we are still using in some of the patients if they are love you don't have a huge group of uh, melanoma patients the ones which come if they are not able to afford the, and they need some systemic therapy this is the way we go about it it is so the they are normally taken as second line now with the advent of immunotherapy but they were the ones which are being used earlier and they were efficacious in some situations so right uh last question to prashant sir Uh, so post excision which has been done in some other center the margins seem adequate but no nodes were uh, addressed would there be a timeline for you where you would go in again versus surveillance um yeah depending on the stage of the uh, leash uh, stage is something that which i would uh, definitely take another presence of risk factors in this group of patients whether the patient had an ulcerator was it thicker or thinner the site of the lesion is it feasible to do these are some of the things that i would take but there is no consensus or no guidelines on how long but actually if you see the mlst trial one of the major drawback for this trial is uh, most of these patients underwent sentinel lymph node biopsies uh, you know too late in their after diagnosis so the average was somewhere close to 120 days uh, so that is uh, one so based on that if you go Well, possibly uh, you know they wouldn't it wouldn't benefit much in these group of patients so there is no definite cut off that is one of the major pitfalls of mlst2 trials because they were not done immediately the same question i think probably that's a real life scenario i would put you excise the lesion and then you know by the time you are referred to a center which has all the facilities uh, you have crossed about 3 to 4 months and uh, we so i think that's a very challenging question and i uh, i would still do it if it is there's no definite dead deadline you know to say that i would do it within a month within two months difficult question to answer but if it is high risk yes i would consider at some point of time but three months i think is what i would keep a cut off of if it is after three months i think i wouldn't uh, do observe the patient and uh, and then take a call as and when we have positive notes because sir and bharat sir because sir your thoughts on it sir so basically the it depends on the patient and uh, where is he coming from and uh, what is his uh, follow up is he going to come regularly for follow up or not all these factors need to be taken into consideration and when you explain the pros and cons i would normally err towards doing a sentinel node lymph node biopsy if it comes within uh, maybe 6 months if anything beyond that and there is no node on a pet and on clinical examination i may not consider anything just keep the patient under observation on the other hand if it is more closer definitely we will do it and err towards uh, more this thing because sometimes patients come from far away and we are not sure about their follow up whether they will come for the next check up also in those situations it is better to go ahead with the lymph node dissection or an slnb or a better this thing this problem we used to face in cancer institute for penile cancers we used to uh, just observe after doing and, and the patient will not come i should will not come and we will land up in a soap because they will come back in uh, one year later with a big node so a purely curable pan patient would become uh, incurable so uh, that way we will go thank you sir uh, so that is the end of the third uh, part of this uh, webinar i thank all the examiners for uh, so patiently answering uh, these questions uh, i request uh, dr sarangi sir uh, to please uh, deliver the vote of thanks from his side sarangi sir it has been a, a wonderful evening again melanoma uh, used to be the bastion of surgeons for a long time and now slowly is been shifted uh, in favor of immunotherapy and a lot of drugs are in the market but they are frightfully expensive so they have to be brought down to a level where they can be affordable and uh, 
today's uh, master class has been a great success the examinee manar has done extremely well well read and stood the uh, all questions very well dr prashant has been brilliant he has covered almost all the treatments of this disease and dr mahajan has put in his lot of wisdom and knowledge and bharat also added to lots of uh, information and i again thanks region supu arnav uh, and all the members of the iso council uh, for their active participation enthusiasm and i think uh, next one again uh, will be of the south zone and radharaman is going to arrange for a topic and uh, examiner and examiner thank you very much again have a wonderful day thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much sir yeah. thank you srijan for much. taking all the effort for yes. getting these things you know go correctly very smoothly yeah very smoothly thank you so much sir okay uh, good night yeah. sharad sir uh, asked me to uh, remind the students here to please become iso members and uh, register for, for the natcon because the registration for natcon comes complimentary this year uh, so that's from uh, sharad sir's side arnab sir are you there uh, yeah arnab is there yeah arnab is not seen Yeah. I think I think we should close. Yeah, I think. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Thank, thank you, Subhan sir. sir. Thank you, Raja Ram thank sir. You. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Uh,